let's get started. So we're gonna make our dough first. We're gonna use room temperature softened butter. Listen, that is not melted butter. Melted butter is not the same. And we go, we want a really pale color, so that's why we're using white sugar here. And this is a secret ingredient. I know it doesn't look like cream cheese, but it is cream cheese. And this is gonna give us a little bit of like a savory flavor and a little bit of tanginess as well. But what we're trying to do is cream the sugar and the butter together. So if you're feeling a lot of granules when you stick your finger in there, that's not good. We're trying to kind of almost dissolve the sugar and the butter. So we're gonna whip these together for about five minutes. They're gonna be much paler in color when we're done. It's gonna be much fluffier. So like you'll see a visual change. That's just whipping in air to that butter and sugar. And then don't forget to scrape down your bowl to make sure that you are incorporating all the ingredients equally. So now you can see we've got a really great creamed butter and sugar. We're good to go. At this point, we're gonna add one egg two egg yolks, and our second secret ingredient is a combo of extracts. I think like vanilla is pretty common in sugar cookies, but we are gonna add a little bit of almond extract as well. A little bit goes a long way, it's a pretty powerful flavor, but it really adds something extra to these sugar cookies and it's really delicious, like you're gonna taste the difference. And to that, we just wanna make sure that all that liquid is well incorporated into the butter and sugar. So once we have the liquids well incorporated, we're gonna add a little bit of kosher salt here. Again, not to make it salty, just to be a flavor enhancer and balance out that sweetness. And so now we've got that in there, we're gonna add our all-purpose flour, and next goes in a little bit of baking powder. And this ingredient is our third little secret ingredient for this recipe, cream of tartar. Cream of tartar is actually what's left over in the barrel after wine making, and it's basically like just an acidic ingredient. So you're adding this, and this is gonna help with a few things. It's gonna give us like a really cool texture in the end, and it's also gonna prevent the cookies from browning too much. So I'm gonna fold in just to get it started because there's a lot of flour in here, I don't wanna make a huge mess, so I'm gonna fold to get it started, finish incorporating it with the beaters because it is a pretty dense mixture. If there's a little bit of floury bits that aren't fully incorporated, that's fine. Again, to have like a really flaky and snappy cookie, you don't want to overwork this mixture. So you're kind of like just incorporating the flour. You don't want to go much more than that. This dough is almost kind of similar to like a pastry where you want to keep it cold all the time. There's a lot of butter in here, so if it gets too greasy, it's gonna be really, really hard to work with, and you're not gonna have really clear, defined shapes. Dough goes on in some cling film, and then you can use the cling film to kind of like pull the pieces together. It's just like kind of sticky, so this is a really easy way to not make a huge mess. So this is gonna go into the fridge, and then we will roll it out in about two hours. Here are a few things you might need for rolling out your cookies. You need a rolling pin or a wine bottle, whatever you have at your house, and then something to measure the thickness with. A ruler or our fourth little trick of this video, which we'll get to later. If you are making a lot of cookies or you're like an avid baker, they do have these like kind of cool rubber rolling pin thingies. I don't know what you call them, like a rolling pin stoppers, guards maybe? It really makes sure that you get like that perfect quarter inch. But you have to have like the perfect size rolling pins and you have to buy them, they're specialty. So we're gonna show you a hack. So the enemy of rolling out anything is sticking to the surface that you're working on. So have a little bit of flour nearby. As you remember, we wanna keep our dough super cold. So I'm gonna work in batches. I'm gonna put half of this back in the fridge and only roll out half at a time. All right, so this is a trick that we learned in culinary school. You really want an even quarter inch all throughout. To get the most even thickness, you wanna press down in your dough like this and it just kind of spreads it before you wanna get into rolling. Every so often you want to do like a quarter turn and that's going to help make sure that you have an even roll as well as to ensure that it's not sticking to the surface. This isn't like pie crust where you really have to be careful about the shape that you're making or whatever. This is just kind of a free for all. So I'm to a good place. I'm not really sure how thick mine is. So how do I measure this? You could use a ruler, but you know what's so annoying about this ruler is like, why does the zero start so far up the ruler? It's not so annoying, but how else can you measure? Bottle caps. I was looking all over the kitchen for something else that's a quarter inch. I like to lay these around the dough while I'm rolling out just to make sure that all sides are that perfect quarter inch. The other thing too is pour out that extra bench flour and that's what we're gonna use to flour our cutters to make sure that the cutters aren't sticking too much to the dough. So dip the cutter all the way in flour, dip off the excess and then go ahead. And then just give it a little like zhuzh, a little shimmy to make sure that you've totally made contact with the surface on the bottom. And if you have enough cutters, what I like to do is go ahead and put all the cutters down and leave them. And that makes sure that nothing's pulling or tugging and you get a really clean shape every time. And now you can start pulling them out. Sometimes the cookie comes with the cutter and sometimes it doesn't. So I like to kind of move around, pull off the excess, put it off to one side, save that dough because you can use that again. 
Just be careful that you're not like pulling or tugging at everything because you really want the shape to be really clean. And then look at that. So you can definitely reuse these scraps. What you want to do is get them back into like a cohesive dough ball and then put them back in the fridge. They're really warm after all that rolling and working with them. So get the cold one out of the fridge and put that one back in there for another like 20 minutes or so so it can firm back up. And there we go. If you have some shapes that are smaller than the other ones, I would put those off to the side so that if you need to pull them early, you can so that they don't overbake. Okay, put these guys in the fridge. If you put them in the oven now, they're gonna spread way too much and they're not gonna have a clean shape. They will come out super clean, super crisp. As you can tell, they're still very pale and they haven't spread that much. Yay. Go ahead and take them off and let them cool completely on a drying rack. Time to decorate. So we chose rural icing because it sets a little bit harder. If you're gonna be really crazy with decorating, rural icing is definitely the way to go. So despite its royal name, a rural icing is pretty simple. So all you really need is some sifted powdered sugar. You might need a little bit of water, a bit of salt, an extract if you'd like it, and egg whites. The thing about this is that we will be consuming this, so you really want to make sure that you're buying pasteurized egg whites so that they're safe for everyone to enjoy. Or you can use meringue powder, which is an egg white substitute. We might need water, it kind of depends on what we're going for. But first we're going to add salt and a little bit of vanilla for flavor, and we're going to put this off to the side. So all the liquids we're going to put on one side of the powdered sugar, and I'll show you why in a second. Make sure to shake those egg whites ahead of time and then they go. Again, making sure that they're on one side of the bowl. And so now we're going to just work in that one part of the bowl and just slowly incorporate more of the powdered sugar as I go. And that's gonna help make sure that I have a really smooth icing. If you're trying to incorporate all of that powdered sugar at once, it's just like a little bit harder to work with and also you probably will get some lumps. Royal icing is all about consistency. So depending on how you want to decorate yours, there's kind of like two consistencies that you're going for. There's a thicker consistency for more of like lining things out or like borders of things. And then there's a flood, which is gonna be just a thinned out version. And that water's gonna come in handy when we're looking for that flood consistency. So we're starting here with a thicker royal icing. We're also gonna add coloring to this, which will thin it out a little bit too. So err on the side of thicker when you're getting started. So we're gonna separate the icing into a few different bowls. If you're gonna be doing a lot of decorating or using a lot of different colors, it's probably worth it to double or even triple this recipe. Go ahead and put in your gel food colorings to get really, really bright colors. The thing that's cool about royal icing is it sets, right? So like it'll set kind of hard. But even in this time, while we're trying to get all, everything set up, you can already see a little bit, this kind of skin that forms on top. So you do wanna work a little bit quickly with royal icing or else cover it with cling film. And then just to fix it, just add a little bit of water and stir. So now we can do one of two things with this flood consistency. Flooding or dipping. Let's go ahead and put the cookie, dip it in the icing, make sure it's really well coated, knock off any excess, and then it's gonna kind of settle into the cookie and be a really smooth and even shape. And then to flood, what you gotta do, you want like a thicker frosting in a piping bag, and then go ahead and just trace the outside with whatever color that you're doing. And then you wanna let this harden for a little bit before you go to the next step. But once it is hard, all you need to do is take that thinned out icing and you can either spoon it in like I'm doing or you can also put it in a piping bag and pipe it in and then use a toothpick to spread it out evenly. That bit that you piped in the beginning is dried so it kind of acts as like a wall or a border to ensure that all of that icing is staying inside. If you're going to put sprinkles on it, go ahead and put the sprinkles on when it's wet. But if you want to decorate over that, go ahead and let that set for a good like 10-15 minutes or so and then you can continue decorating on top of it. So it kind of depends what look you're going for. And as you can see, like these dots are kind of settling on top of it and not really falling into that flood. And then if you want to decorate any more or put any other like toppings on top of it, you're gonna to have to layer more icing on just to make sure that they stick. There's like something magical about this. Baking cookies, it's kind of like what gets you ready for the holidays, right? Like, you know it's the holiday season when it's time to bake the sugar cookies and it's time to decorate them. And you know, people really appreciate the time and effort that goes into like a home decorated cookie and like does it look like a professional no but that's not the point you know the point is that you took the time you did it you put in your love and care there's like no better way to bond with your friends and family than doing something tangible DIY and creative like this
When we set out to make the ultimate chocolate cake, one thing that we were really going after was a really dark, rich black color. And so to help us achieve that, we decided to opt for the Dutch processed cocoa, which is a little bit darker. By a little bit, I mean a lot of it. It's like a much richer, darker color. And a lot of that just comes into the way that it's produced. First things first, you want to preheat your oven and prep your tins for baking. Here's a cool trick for making this really painless. Taking three strips of parchment, folding it in half, fold it in half again, and then with your eye on this left bottom corner, you're gonna fold up 45 degrees and then fold it again. And then take that point and roughly measure from the center to the edge, and that'll be where you cut. And then when it comes out and you unfold it, it's a perfect circle that fits into your tin. You don't wanna get the batter made, you know, have those leaveners working and then not have your tins ready to go. Now this cake has three components and what we're gonna start with is sifting our dry ingredients into a bowl. Sifting is important because it aerates the dry ingredients as well as ensures that there's no big clumps or any other weird things that would be sitting in like your flour. I don't know, like sometimes there's little bits of stuff so this just ensures that none of that gets in your final cake. So the first secret ingredient in this cake is stout. The stout is a lot of different things, but it also adds a really cool, interesting depth of flavor that you really can't get with just using water alone. The second secret ingredient is espresso powder, and this helps really enhance the chocolate flavor. The espresso and the stout are gonna give you that extra boost that makes you think like, oh, what's in this? It's so good and rich. So we have the dry ingredients, we have the wet ingredients ready to go. The next thing we're gonna do is cream our butter and sugar. You really wanna do this for a while. You're not just combining them, you're really trying to get a lot of air beat into the butter and sugar. From time to time, you wanna scrape down the bowl to ensure that you're getting everything really evenly creamed in together. As always with eggs, we recommend breaking them into a bowl separately first, just in case it's like a bad egg or you get a bunch of eggshell in. Whoop. The butter and the sugar can only absorb so much liquid at once, so that's why you really wanna take your time and add one egg at a time. It's super buttery, look at that. Now, for the third secret ingredient, don't freak out, it's mayonnaise. There's a lot of other secret ingredients that are in chocolate cakes. I've seen anything from sour cream to sour kraut. We're only putting about a half cup in here. You're not gonna taste it. It's gonna be extremely moist and rich. You can already see how much more creamy this is making our batter. Now, switch off between adding our dry and our wet ingredients. So you don't have to be too crazy about this. Just dump, you know, a good third in. A big part of why you're doing this in stages is mostly just because if you added it all at once, it would go everywhere and be a huge mess. Just take your time, add it kind of every other. Optional, we're gonna fold in some dark chocolate chunks. What the chocolate chunks will also do is add like a third texture to the cake. So you're gonna have this really gooey, fudgy cake with that rich buttercream that we're gonna show you how to make later. And then you're gonna have these nice little bits of chocolate, kind of that journey of different textures and flavors throughout. Because we have chemical leaveners in here with that baking soda and baking powder, you don't want to let this sit out for too long. That's why we preheated our oven and prepped our tins. It's not going to dome as much as some other cakes. It's actually going to come out pretty flat, which is really great so we're not wasting anything by cutting off that top dome. We did test a ton of recipes and we didn't like how a lot of them would dome so much that you have to cut that off in order to get good layers for your cake. Let them cool in there pretty significantly. To turn them over, the easiest way is just putting a plate over top and then flipping them one by one. And you want to put them back on the drying rack and have them cool completely before touching them again. You never want to decorate a warm cake. If you put buttercream on a hot cake, it will just completely melt the frosting. The thing about buttercream is it seems really easy, but the temperature of your butter as well as the temperature of your kitchen and what you're doing really makes a big difference. If you're really struggling to get it on the cake, it probably needs just like a little bit of warmth to make it spread better. More for not making a mess, I tend to end my dry ingredients into the butter slowly, just because everyone's had that experience when they toss a whole bunch of powdered sugar in and turn their mixer on, and then there's powdered sugar all over you in the kitchen. So slowly incorporate your powdered sugar and add milk as needed. Now that our cakes are cooled and our buttercream is made, it's time to decorate. We're gonna put down parchment paper, and we do that to keep our cake stand or platter or whatever you're using clean. So this is my favorite tool in the entire world. An offset spatula is gonna change your life. So as you can see, it's nice and flat. I don't need to do anything weird to it. I'm not cutting off any top of it. I'm not gonna have any waste. And look at how great this color is. I mean, it's so dark. It's gonna be like, ugh, the best color. I'm gonna put a whole bunch of icing right on top. In between the layers, you wanna use more frosting than you think. It doesn't have to look pretty. It doesn't have to be perfect. 
If you put a whole bunch in the middle and kind of push down, it'll help get the icing all the way out to the sides. A nice thin layer all over the top. And then what I like to do, I don't know if this is like a pro tip, but I like to kind of dab with the back of the spatula, distribute frosting all over. Then you can start smoothing it. I would say when in doubt, just add more frosting than you think. It's much easier to take frosting off than it is to try and work with a little bit of frosting and try and spread it out evenly. If you can't get a really even layer, what you could do is kind of go for that rustic look and take the tip of your spatula and do little S's back and forth and just kind of like dot it all around. We're not gonna do that, but that's like a little tip for you if you're going crazy. My struggle with decorating cakes is I never know when to stop and sometimes like, you'll just keep going and going and going and it was fine like five minutes ago. Just stop, don't keep going. You could go on forever. It looks great. Put the spatula down. <laughs> you can put anything on here. You can put shaved chocolate, you can put you know sprinkles, you can put shaved coconut, a whole bunch of stuff. I love the look of just fresh fruit on everything. To get that perfect slice, you want to run your knife under hot water or put it in like a pitcher of hot water. Every time you make a cut, clean it off. If you have icing and crumb all over your knife and then you go and cut down, you're going to carry that all into the next slice. It's really well balanced between the cake and the frosting, not overly sweet. You learn a lot of fundamentals with this recipe that you can take with you in a lot of other cake recipes that you do.